Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. You know, the economy is a man-made structure. That's right, it's got engineers, financial engineers, economic engineers, thinkers, philosophers, and they build it over time. What happens when the foundation evaporates? What happens when the structure collapses? What happens when the simulation goes away? Let's find out from Stacy Herbert. Well, Max, you know there was some art a few years ago when we used to be able to meet in person and at that um, Basel Art Festival, I think it was, in uh, Miami. We had some banana on the wall. Well, you might say our balance sheet is looking like that. Banana Meat Republic. Budget deficit hits record $3 trillion as U.S. spends 100% more than it earns. Unfortunately, due to helicopter money, it is unlikely that the exploding deficit will ever shrink again until the monetary system is overhauled. So year to date, and we have only have one month left in fiscal 2020, the U.S. has spent $6.05 trillion and collected just $3.048 trillion, which means that its outlays are 100% more than its receipts. Many are asking, why, don't we, why do we even collect this $3 trillion in taxes? Why don't we just, like, print money for everybody? Right. It brings up a lot of questions. You know, one thing is that the deficit is huge, and it's more than 100% of GDP, and that's true for countries around the world in some places. 200, 300% GDP. But what's creeping up now is the interest on that deficit. Even at these low, low interest rates, near 0% interest rates, the interest cost on the deficit is getting close to America's outlay for the military, which is their biggest expense. So usually what happens when, in fact, the interest on the debt gets to a point where that also equals your GDP as a country, you are technically in default and you are officially no longer a country. What is left is a memory of a country. You know, we're at that point in the game. You know, in Monopoly, if you play Monopoly, there's always a point in the game where you realize, well, somebody has a, a, a strategic amount of property on the board, and they're going to win. And what, the only thing left for us to do is kind of uh, march toward the inevitable of losing. And this is the problem now with this economy in the U.S. The game of the U.S. is now over because there is no path out. There is no escape from the toxic debt. There is no recovery at this point. There's only how to manage the loss. It's going to be economic collapse with honor if Richard Nixon were in charge and this were the Vietnamization of the economy. How do we honorably fail? Of course, all of this debt, the deficit gets added to the uh, national debt every year. Like, you know, I remember when it first hit a trillion dollars and we were like, whoa, and then it hit $10 trillion and we we're like, whoa. And then now it's like 25, 30 trillion. It's just like escalating so rapidly. And who knows, like the whole time when it first hit a trillion, people were shocked and scared. And then it, when it hit 10 trillion, people were like, oh my God, this can't last. And then it hit 20 trillion and now 25 trillion. And, you know, you wonder how long it can go parabolic. Like, can it get to 100 trillion? Can it get to a quadrillion and, and the world continue as it is? But it feels like, you know, if you're comparing it to the game of Monopoly, that somebody's cheating and somebody's getting free goods and services and rental income and things like that. Right. The dice are loaded, right? And when the bankers roll the dice, they somehow always pass, go, collect free money and get another property. Mm. When everyone else rolls the dice, somehow they end up in prison. And <laughs> so that's uh, the way this game is played. And that's why the wealth and income gap have exploded polarization and the social unrest in America is, hasn't been this bad. I think it's worse than the Vietnam War. It's, you got to go back to the Civil War to find social unrest as bad in America as it is today. Well, you talked about, you know, you get a, another property on this Monopoly board. You get handed it and gifted it. Well, this is um, really playing out in the COVID economy, the COVID reality, where the commercial real estate sector is collapsing. Of course, that our elected representatives are coming to the rescue of those uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities and stuff like that. But, you know, look at this data. It just seems like with this game of monopoly, if our game of monopoly of our fiat money and all this free money is based around this illusion of the monopoly board and all the commercial real estate, well, here's another plank. Like, if, if, 
if people are just like scratching out part of the board that this doesn't exist anymore, what do you have left but a pile of cash? An entire asset class redefined almost overnight by COVID work from home. Total value of all U.S. commercial real estate is $16 trillion, now entering largest bear market since late 80s. 50% price drop wipes out $8 trillion. Major economic drag, knock-on effects huge. Rates stay 0% plus gold and Bitcoin is what uh, Dan Tapiro is recommending. So here's the commercial real estate demand collapses. The crashing line is the plans to expand any office space. Right. That gets back to my comment at the top of the show. The economics and economies are engineered. They're built. It's a man-made construct. And in the U.S., you have at the core of that economy property and commercial property. And that's mostly what banks lend against. And this is the pyramid, if you will, of not necessarily a pyramid scheme, but it is a, a pyramid-like structure. And if you pull out the bottom and you have COVID economy, and suddenly all that commercial property is suspect and maybe not worth 10 cents on the dollar, then the entire pyramid will collapse just as a function of physics, as a function of engineering. That's what will happen. Thinking about also properties being handed out like candy if you're in the right class. It, let's take a look. According to the most recent information, the U.S. government is going to hand TikTok a Chinese company to Larry Ellison over at Oracle. Now, why? Why is Larry Ellison being gifted a multi-billion dollar gift like this? For, for what reason? Why is that happening? He's not giving it to the American people, the President of the United States. He's not engineering some dividend for us. He's simply giving this huge asset to one of his friends. Okay, that's not the way economics is supposed to work unless it's corrupt. Right, Larry Ellison gets handed uh, Bite Dance's TikTok. We, we don't know if that's actually going to go through, if the, um, the, the secret sauce of the artificial intelligence, which is, I think, what everybody wants, certainly in the United States, certainly the intelligence agencies and stuff like that want that, whether or not China will allow it, who knows. But, you know, speaking of, of you know, free money and free stuff is I read a remarkable statistic is that we know that 75% of Americans who have to work for a living, that they're making more money. They made more money since the COVID crisis because of the $600 extra enhanced unemployment benefits that they received per week. Now, that has caused a knock-on effect of a huge uh, collapse in the number of defaults on used uh, car loans. So that's a positive. It's kind of like a jubilee. But also, they said 20% of Americans have doubled their income under COVID. Whatever, forget the pandemic and the, the situation there. But as we head into an election, who is in their right mind? Of those 20% who have doubled their income on this monopoly board called America, like, who is going to say, well, you know, my income doubled under Trump, but I'm going to vote for the other guy who I've never seen because he sits in the basement all day. Like, it just seems like this is going to be a spanner in the, in the Biden works that is just not being discussed. It seems remarkable to be doubling your income and yet getting to stay home. Yeah, I think that's uh, certainly the numbers would bear that out, that um, people would not vote against that. And the other thing is that this is now an open experiment into universal basic income. Yes. Right? So this is uh, America gets to see what happens if you apply universal basic income and you get to see how it impacts society. Is it an incentive or is it, does it de-incentivize work? And uh, we may find that uh, this is a permanent feature going forward. And also that doubling of the income uh, shows that the folks that were living under a basic living wage, those folks that were the working poor who were, let's say, working at Walmart, the biggest employer in America, but still needing government relief. Uh, that, in other words, Walmart got the government to subsidize their wages being that they had to pay. So those questions are now, I think, going to have to be resolved uh, as a result of this incredible experiment in universal basic income in America that we can now have some data to figure out how to go forward. And the other thing, of course, is that, you know, when we made front running uh, almost a year ago, you know, at the late November, early December, we, we were presenting things like that that were being presented by candidates 
like Bernie Sanders as very radical left-wing ideas. And we even said that, you know, these might come in, these obviously aren't going to happen now, but maybe in a decade or two as Generation Z and millennials become uh, more powerful. But like within a few months, you know, Donald Trump, who we were told is a super fascist and super right wing, he's bringing in these radical left wing policies. So he's it, 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 he's interesting in that he exposes so much of the contradictions in U.S. elite society and he forces their hand like this next story as well. Nearly 300 homeless men who had been temporarily living in a hotel on the Upper West Side of Manhattan will be relocated after weeks of backlash from some residents who said the men had diminished the quality of life in the upscale neighborhood. The Upper West Side, you know, this is Democratic heartland. This is the elite Democratic heartland. This is the Rachel Maddows. This is the Anderson Coopers. This is the Hillary Clintons of the world. These are the, that, that sort of corporate dem. And here they're, they, they, they don't want these dirty, stinky, poor people in their neighborhood. They're fine for, you know, this sort of stuff to happen and everybody else's. They're the ones that pass laws. They're the ones that pass tax increases for all sorts of policies that they don't want in their own backyard. Right. What will we make at Zabar's, an institution on the Upper West Side where you get some nice, uh, lovely uh, food? And uh, But that would be a problem, as you point out. What do they call it? NIMBYism, not in my backyard. Right. So the policies sound great on paper, but people don't actually want to live with them or they want they figure that they're immune from actually living with the consequences of what they support. And um, so um, I suppose that they're going to have to take those f folks and move them into East Hampton and then they can live in the Hamptons for a while and see how that goes. <laughs> um, but you could look at this through the entire spectrum. Uh, you know, with their foreign policy, the neoconservatives are mostly Democrats. Right. Um, originally. So all the neocons that ruled under George Bush and they, their foreign policy was invasion of Iraq, invasion of, of uh, Iran, of eventually Yemen, all of those sort of countries, that was their plan. But they all started out as Democrats and then they became Republicans because they couldn't stand the left wing of the, of the Democratic Party. So like this is something that is, it, it, we're still trying to reconcile. That comes, that happens during '68. It happens all the time in the in the Democratic side. But it's it's around this tension around, um, you know, imperialism and this monopoly board. Like, who do you want a homeless, you know, homeless people staying in the hotel that you own that because the government makes you because of the pandemic? <laughs> you know, Margaret Thatcher was a bit of a detestable person, but she did say the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. Uh, I think uh, we're hitting that situation in the United States. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to author and economist Dr. Michael Hudson. Dr. Hudson, welcome back. Good to be back, Max. All righty. Well, let's. Uh, we we lost a mutual friend, David Graber, author of Debt: The First Five Thousand Years. Why did David matter? I know you were friends with him. What are his contributions to our understanding of money? He realized that most money is debt and that money was created uh, not uh, as part of the barter process, uh, not by merchants, but money was created to pay debts, starting with debts that people owed uh, the temples and the palaces of the ancient Near East, and to buy services uh, and goods from the palaces and temples. Uh, at the end of uh, every crop year, uh, uh, people had to pay for uh, the uh, the beer that they drunk during the year, the agricultural inputs, and most payments were made only uh, once a year. Uh, so when you do a transaction, money wasn't involved at all uh, because you only had money once a year. If you were a cultivator or a peasant, uh, you'd wait until the harvest and uh, you'd sign a contract. And uh, uh, when you would go to the local bar and have some ale, and we have the contracts, uh, they would uh, say, well, at the end of the year, you're going to pay your tab uh, on, on the threshing floor. And uh, when your grain is all measured out uh, that you've harvested, we're going to take uh, the payment of, that you owe is debt, and uh, we're going to take uh, it. And every uh, uh, bushel of grain that you pay is equal to 
one uh, shekel of silver. So, uh, and the silver also had to be paid, you know, once uh, uh, occasionally at the end of a five-year uh, trading venture uh, for goods and services or money that the palace or the temples consigned. So that uh, Graeber, uh, emphasized, by emphasizing debt, he showed that money was really for paying debt. It wasn't part of the barter process. It wasn't what the Austrians, uh, uh, economists, and the uh, creditors said at all. It was part of a fiscal uh, policy and that debts were owed to the state. Uh, and that's why uh, it was possible for the rulers of Mesopotamia uh, to cancel the debts because they were canceling debts to themselves initially, owed mainly to themselves and to the palace uh, collectors. Uh, things became much harder in Rome and uh, an antiquity in the modern times when today uh, debts are owed by the uh, 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 owed to the banks uh, and to the one percent. And so David's main uh, emphasis uh, in discussing money was uh, to explain why a debt cancellation, which was his main objective, uh, was uh, going to work, had worked uh, for many years in Mesopotamia, and uh, his uh, debt the first five thousand years essentially uh, uh, followed the arguments that I had been making in an academic uh, setting in my Harvard University uh, colloquia. And uh, we had long discussions maybe 15 years ago. And I didn't think anybody was going to be interested in uh, uh, debt in, in Mesopotamia and the origins of debt and money until uh, I could make the point that debts today had to be canceled. And David said, no, no give them the long perspective. Uh, uh, l l let me write up uh, your ideas as a popular book. And uh, I, I uh, was um, pleasantly amazed to see how popular his uh, debt book caught on. And he expressed uh, the debt issue and a monetary issue, not in abstract uh, academic theory, but in terms of uh, uh, his own personal experience as an anthropologist, in terms of the anthropology of debt, and people could accept the idea of debt cancellation much more readily when you're talking about uh, an anthropological tribe in, uh, in uh, Madagascar or somewhere, or when you're talking about Mesopotamia. So just as Shakespeare would put his uh, uh, political plays in uh, Italy or uh, Illyria or somewhere else, uh, instead of in England, where it would have been uh, highly political, uh, David was able to make his point uh, about debt and debt cancellation uh, and money uh, in terms of anthropology. You mentioned something there. I want to return to it. So you're, you were talking about the origins of money is debt, and the, the debt was, came, came from government, essentially. And it gave the government the opportunity to cancel debt when it, whenever it was prudent or a necessity to do so. For example, during debt jubilees, when when the uh, the the central authority would cancel debt. And then you mentioned that um, our our modern era really is about debt being created by the private banks. And of course, the central bank is a private bank. And that is brought on a whole new era uh, where debt is used in a much different way than simply fueling the economy. It seems as though private debt from banks and central banks is used in, in the greater interest of those few banks that are issuing the debt versus, let's say, government-issued debt, going back to David Graeber's work, which seem to be more in the interest of society at large. Your thoughts? The problem is how uh, the rulers of Mesopotamia had to take into account overall society. If they would have let, had the debts be paid, then the farmers, the peasants, the cultivators would have lost their liberty. They would have had to uh, give their labor to the creditors. They would have had to become bond servants, as you read about in the Bible. And if you become bond servants, then you lose your liberty. You lose the land because you forfeit that as collateral to the uh, creditors. And uh, uh, the result is, uh, what, would, what would they do if they're uh, going to be bond servants or uh, losing their land? They would flee to uh, another tribe. They, they would leave. Uh, and uh, then the 
uh, country, the ruler that let its uh, creditors take over society, would find all of a sudden it's depopulated. Well, just like the uh, the Greeks have left uh, Greece uh, after uh, it, the European Union bankrupted it, uh, just as the uh, Baltic, uh, Latvia, has lost one third of its population since uh, uh, it got independent in 1991. People are leaving because it's a society that doesn't work. Well, right now, uh, you're having a similar phenomenon in the United States. You're having, uh, ever since uh, uh, 2009, uh, you had uh, Obama uh, say, uh, we're not going to cancel the debts. We're going to pretend to cancel them, but uh, we're not really going to. We're going to let uh, my uh, campaign banker, backers, uh, the bankers, uh, kick 10 million factory families off their, uh, out of their houses. We're going to make them homeless. Uh, and that same, uh, uh, just as that same expropriation of debtors occurred uh, after 2009, we're seeing an imminent uh, similar expropriation right today in the middle of the coronavirus. Uh, uh, families uh, who lose their job are unable to pay their rents, uh, and either their landlords are defaulting, or if they have a job and bought a house with a mortgage, they're unable to pay the mortgage, and there's going to be a new wave of foreclosures, of homeless people. Uh, but unlike uh, uh, Sumer and Babylonia, and unlike uh, Greeks who can move to uh, Germany and Europe, where are the Americans who are uh, expropriated going to go? Uh, it, the, you had uh, the Egyptians uh, in antiquity say, well, if we don't uh, cancel the debts, then uh, our people are going to uh, defect to the enemy. But uh, who's the enemy? Uh, today, no, no Americans going to defect to Russian and China because Americans aren't good at speaking a foreign language. Uh, where can they go? So uh, uh, the dynamic is the same today as it has been for 5,000 years. That was David's main main point. Uh, but the way in which it's handled is different. Uh, in uh, ancient society, they wouldn't let uh, the creditor interests destroy society depopulated and uh, polarized society between creditors and debtors. But today, we don't have that ethic anymore. Today, we let society polarize between the 1% at the top uh, who hold the 99% in debt, and uh, all the, the income of the 1% is what they can extract in debt service and financial fees and rents, including monopoly rents, from the 99%. So uh, you're having uh, a whole failure, not only of uh, uh, the whole way in which Western civilization has been going since uh, uh, Roman times, uh, but a failure of uh, the 19th century to really get rid of landlordship, to really uh, uh, turn industrial capitalism into uh, socialized industrial capitalism, where uh, the banks are run uh, uh, in uh, order to uh, promote economic growth and living standards instead of destroy economic growth and living standards. So we have uh, somehow industrial capitalism and the whole ethic of Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Marx, uh, Thorstein Veblen, has all uh, been defeated, and we have the ethic of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and uh, uh, Donald Trump and Obama. Right, so you and David arguing in favor of state-run debt uh, versus uh, private bankers uh, running the debt. Well, you don't need a state-run economy in order to solve the debt problem. Uh, I don't think Adam Smith and the classical economists advocated a state-run economy. They advocated a different kind of rules. They said that, first of all, uh, land, uh, the, the rent of land should uh, be taken into the public sector. Uh, John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith said the land, uh, the taxes should be levied on land and on, on wealth, not on labor not on industry. Uh, so that's simply the tax system. Uh, and then later in the 19th century, people said, well, uh, we need uh, the banks to be part of the government sector. Uh, if the government uh, is the creditor, the government doesn't have to control the economy. Uh, but uh, normally the creditor decide the banks, who, whether it's the creditor uh, as a private banker or as a government agency, like uh, the New Deal agencies under Roosevelt, uh, the bankers uh, and creditors decide 
who is going to get the credit and what are they going to get the credit for? And all you need is to control the credit system and you can steer credit uh, in, a, in a, a, a private sector capitalist economy into the most productive sectors. But that's not what's happening now. Uh, in the 19th century, everybody uh, expected uh, banking to evolve like it was in, in Germany. Uh, banks would uh, be, banking would be industrialized. Uh, finance would be industrialized to finance industrial growth and uh, uh, real means of production. But instead, uh, after World War I, you've had industry being financialized. Uh, and uh, the uh, financial sector, the banks, uh, don't lend to build factories. They don't build for capital accumulation. They lend uh, against capital and assets that are already in place. Private banks basically uh, look for what they can foreclose on, not uh, how they can add to living standards and uh, uh, product means of production. All right, we've got to carry this over to a second segment. I'm learning a lot here. Uh, thanks for being on the show, Dr. Michael Hudson. That's it for this episode of Kaiser Report with me, my Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Michael Hudson. Until next time, bye, y'all.